The scripture reading for today, of course we are in Matthew 5, but we are going to be looking specifically at verses 14, 15, and 16. But since this is the end of uh, our series, I thought that we would just begin at the beginning of chapter 5 and read through the entire introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Just uh, not only to bring our focus down to this final point where it all seems to be distilled, but to maybe go through what Spurgeon called that ladder of light in our heads one more time. So here now the word of the Lord, as my good friend Ross likes to say, these will be the most important words that you hear me say. And seeing the multitudes, he, that is Jesus, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And the Lord add his blessing to that reading. So here we are, the conclusion to our in-depth study of the Beatitudes. And since it's been 12 weeks, perhaps a refresher is uh, where we should begin. Why did we even start this? Well, we started it for uh, several reasons, but we picked up a, a reason that was actually started six decades ago by David Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a, a British pastor and sermon and theologian, and he actually did the entire Sermon on the Mount. So um, he had a mountain, I have just created a, a, a little molehill by comparison. But his main impetus was this, to combat what he saw, remember this is 1959, to combat what he saw as uh, an epidemic of superficial Christianity. The nation, when he looked at it, was just full, chock-a-block, they might say, since they were in the UK, was just full of Christians calling themselves Christians. They were wearing the label of Christians, but they sure weren't acting like Christians. They weren't genuine Christians. There was something extremely lacking in their faith, and in, I'm, I'm positive, in a great number of cases, they were not actually saved. And so he began an examination of this, and, and we have picked it up as well. The whole reason that we've started looking at the Beatitudes is because they're not a listing of things. This will be the last time you have to hear me say this. But they're not a listing of things we do. They are descriptors of who we are, who we are as citizens in the kingdom of God. And citizens who have these descriptors... I mean, if you can sit back this morning and run through the list of eight or ten of these and generally examine yourself to see if you'll be in the faith and check them off and go, yes, I was poor in spirit. I acknowledged my poverty of spirit. Yes, I did mourn before God. I remember at the point of my salvation. If you can go through all of that, congratulations. You are a citizen in the heavenly kingdom. Now, there's a strange thing about the Beatitudes. They are, at, one, at, at once and at the same time, maybe I should say, they are the gate and the path. They are the gate by which 
citizens come into the kingdom. There's no coming into this kingdom unless you repent of your sins, unless you come humbly and meekly before God, unless you genuinely hunger and thirst for righteousness so that he bestows it on you. In, in other ways, there's no coming into this kingdom as we've explored without shedding the old self, without allowing Christ to clothe you with his righteousness and build you anew. But once we're in the kingdom, I think you'll find, and I hope you find in your walk, not only today but afterwards, that we come back around to the first one. That is how we continue to walk the path now that we're in the gate. The Beatitudes are also the path. They are a, a, a travel log, we might say, as we walk now into ever more likeness of Christ. Constantly, throughout the rest of our lives, we will return to a self-examination. Am I poor in spirit? Yes, yes I am. I'm saved, I'm redeemed, but boy, there were miles to go. Even saying that, even acknowledging where we backslide, acknowledging where we come short, that is acknowledging our spiritual poverty. And then we mourn over that. And then we come meekly before God. And then we cry out, I know I, you have filled me with your righteousness, but train me, correct me, I, I need more. I need more lessons, more righteousness. And so you can see, once you go through this ladder, you actually just end up right back at the beginning again. It's a beautiful, blessed cycle. And for the genuine, dynamic Christian, it is something that we will go through again and again and again, improving each time we do, until at last our Savior calls us home and we stand before him in perfection. In perfection, with nothing wanting. So this is it. This is the final beatitude. And I believe of all of them, all ten of them, that this is the single greatest challenge facing our particular church. And by that I mean the contemporary Canadian church. This is, this is the big one for us. Why do I say that? Because this beatitude defines superficial Christians. This is really where you can tell the superficial from the genuine, the phoning it in from the dynamic. Superficial Christians hide their light. They hide their light so that they don't draw attention to themselves. Superficial Christians hide their light because it would, might draw attention to themselves. It might put them in danger, or it might cause offense, or it might cause waves. Now, this is a partner verse to the preceding one about being the salt of the earth. And therefore, this too is about how the beatitudinal Christian, having shed the old self, having been made a new creature, is now sent back out into the world as a representative of the kingdom to show people how they too can become citizens, how they too can bend the knee and espouse Christ as Lord and reap all those benefits that come with that. Now, just last week, we, we saw that there was an underlying presupposition in these two. And I'll, I'll refresh your memory. We are the salt of the earth, yes? But if we are made salt of the earth, it must be because the world needs salt. Can we agree on that? That makes sense? Why does the world need salt? When we, when we examined what salt was used for, in an age before refrigeration, which Jesus is preaching in, salt is a preservative. If you've ever had salted pork or any type of meat packed in salt, I don't know how old some of you are, it used to be a staple of sea voyages. I don't know, right? right? Packed in salt, why? Because salt prevents putrefaction. If something is rotting, if something is dying, salt poured into a wound, it's got medicinal aspects of it, salt prevents putrefaction. And therefore, if we are made salt, it's because we are now charged to go into a world that is dying, that is rotten, that is putrefying. And we are to be an element that stands in opposition to that. We are the not-so-glorious but incredibly important antiseptic of the world which is probably why nobody has written a hymn about it. Also, it would be hard to rhyme. Right? So just as the world is putrefying and therefore in need of salt, we are made light. Now, why are we made light? 
because the world is dark. These two Beatitudes describe the world in its horrible, horrible ugliness. It is dark and it is dying. Now what do we mean by that? Is the world filled with nothing, Brayden? Is it filled with nothing but depression and ugliness? Certainly not. Certainly not. I'm sure that five or six inches of snow last week was very picturesque. Awful to drive in, but lovely to look at, right? The creation is filled with beauty. Seas, rivers. What else did I write here? The stars, the, the veins that you find in a leaf in the fall. When Holly, Holly and, and her grandmother used to, used to wax leaves. Anyone else, right? Used to press them in a book and wax them. I mean, when you look at every aspect of the creation, from the micro to the macro, we stand in wonder and go, my God, how great thou art. The beauty of the creation, the intricate design of the creation overwhelms us. So we can't just sit back and go, wow, it's a horrible, dark, awful, awful creation. And yet, it does have those dimensions to it. But if we stop and consider, I think that we will find that much of the ugliness comes from us. The ugliness in creation largely stems from mankind. Let me say this, the world is dark and brutal. I won't, I won't try to convince you otherwise, but it is dark and brutal because men are dark and brutal towards one another. They steal, they lie, they kill, they abuse, they self-indulge, they are callous towards the suffering of their fellows. So if we say the world is dark, then as with all the previous Beatitudes, we're talking about a spiritual darkness. We talked about spiritual poverty, mourning spiritually, yearning for humility in a spiritual sense. It's all spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. And these last two Beatitudes are no different. There is a spiritual putrefaction in the world that needs to be addressed, that needs to be excised by our being salt. And there is a spiritual darkness and scripture tells us it's not just present in the world, but in this current age, till Christ come again, it is actually running the show. What do we talk about when we say spiritual darkness? This is I, critical for us to understand. Let's understand the world that we've been called into. I've come up with three general terms. Spiritual darkness, first of all, is ignorance of God. The people just dwell in darkness, as we hear every Christmas. The people who dwell in darkness. And what, are they, what, what is it that brings them out of that darkness? They see a great light. They see the light of Christ. But until that comes, they dwell in darkness, which means they are ignorant of God. Cast your minds over to Luke 1, right? Speaking of Christmas, so uh, Mary is already with child. No, sorry. Um, Mary's cousin, right, is already with child. And Zacharias is prophesying over the birth of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And in Luke 1, verse 76, this is part of what he says over his son. Remember, he's allowed to speak again. This is what he says over his son. He says, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Why? Because they didn't know. They were ignorant. Verse 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Zechariah says, you, my son, you, my boy, my precious boy, you're going to educate a people who don't know any better. John 1, 4, right? Describing Christ. In him was life. In him was life. And the life was what? It was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness, right? Comprehended it not. Comprehended it not. They remained in ignorance. A spiritual darkness begins with an ignorance of God, of who he is, of his place in creation at the apex, of his work, of his holiness, of his wrath, of all his attributes. Sit in darkness, they are completely ignorant of God. Secondly, because of that ignorance, stemming from it, 
and at the same time, spiritual darkness is active rebellion against God. We learned earlier, men hate God. You heard me quote the amazing theologian, uh, American theologian that was uh, Jonathan Edwards, who said it far better than I ever could about how the unsaved man, maybe he doesn't even know how much he hates God, but he hates God, hates his law, hates his word, hates his, his structures for society. Darkness is that hate in motion. It is active rebellion against God. Psalm 107. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because, why? Verse 11. Because they rebelled against the words of God. And they contemned very beautiful Elizabethan words. It means they treated with contempt the counsel of the Most High. Not only don't they know God, but the ones that know him it, totally ignore him. They actively hate him. The third way we might examine spiritual darkness is to be enslaved by, right? To, to be in spiritual darkness is to be in the servitude and the enslavement of Satan the prince of darkness, who has, for God's purposes, been allowed to run the, run the world for the time being, just for the time being. In Acts 26, Paul is on his mission to the Gentiles and repeats uh, these words that Christ personally sent him, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Why? So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and in the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So, if you are in the world, if you are in a worldly faith narrative, if you are in any type of worldly or man-generated philosophy, no matter how it seems, no matter how enlightening it might make you feel, it is in fact a tool of darkness. So the world is dark and in desperate need of light. Hence, the Christian is sent. Because only Christ is that light that it so desperately needs. And only Christians have the light of Christ within them. I don't know if we talk about this enough. I mean, I, I, just, I could assemble a laundry list of things, I think, that we don't continually bring to mind enough. But Here's one more reminder. Christ lives in you, and you live in him. So when you're going about your daily lives and your work, don't forget that. This is the thing that makes us stop and say, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm eating or drinking or whatever I'm doing, am I glorifying God? Because it should be. Because I am in him, and he is in me. Listen to this. John 8, very familiar words. I am the light of the world, says Jesus. And then in John 8, he says this, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. That's pretty clear. Christ is in us. And therefore, if Christ is the light of the world, it is Christ's light that exudes from us. That's important to note. It's not our own light. It's not a light that we've achieved or developed. It doesn't stem out of any system or philosophy. It is simply the indwelling Holy Spirit, the indwelling of Christ in us that just naturally exudes through us. Christians are the light of the world. But what does light do? Let's look at that. What does light do? in a spiritual sense. We know what light does physically. It's dark, I put on the light, ah, I can see. Now I can go down the basement steps and not trip and fall. But what does light spiritually do? First thing it does is that light illuminates a pathway. All right, it does this physically, but it does it spiritually as well. Let me give you this example, all right? If I go camping and I have a flashlight, or I go to put the dog out, our backyard is, is pitch black. So I put the dog out at night, I take a flashlight with me. 
If I turn that flashlight on and then put it in my coat pocket, is it doing me any good? <laughs> no. Why, why would you do such a thing, Braden? Why would you do that one? If I take a flashlight and then turn it on to go check the, you know, when the fuses blow, and then I just cover it up with my hand and fumble around with the, like, how would I even find where I'm going? That's how I end up at the bottom of the basement stairs. So a light illuminates a safe pathway. But light does something else, spiritual light especially. It warns of danger. Now, if you've ever been out on the, either of the coasts, I'm thinking particularly down east, you've seen a lighthouse. And even if you haven't, you know Peggy's Cove. We all know the famous lighthouse there. And the, uh, the efforts actually to save it from, because the coast is eroding. It's going to fall in. But light warns of danger. Again, I, I think of the lighthouse. Think of warning ships away from reefs and rocks. Think of the, uh, the little light that comes on the iron to let you know not to grab it by the bottom. Right? A light warns of danger. There was... Um, Speaking of lighthouses, so I'm sure this, this anecdote is, is familiar to some of you. There is a story that floats around. It, uh, it grew out of a cartoon. I've been able to try to trace the history of it. It started as a cartoon, a British cartoon, in 1931, and then was later reprinted by a newspaper down east here in Canada. And it's since become a, a popular anecdote, even though it's very likely not true, but nonetheless, it is a suitable parable for us this morning. Maybe you've heard of it. This is the transcript of a radio conversation between a U.S. Navy ship and Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. And the story first started to surface around 1995. And it goes like this. Americans, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. They're on a ship, and they look out in the night to see a light. They, it's another ship coming at them. They say... Change your course. And the Canadians respond back, uh, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. Americans, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no, I say again, divert your course. And the Americans, now getting somewhat indignant and prideful, completely unlike them. <laughs> Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. To which the Canadians reply, this is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> so Christians are to warn people to change away from a dangerous course and to show them at the same time the true path of safety. Light, wrote John MacArthur, is the communication of the content of the gospel. That's the light that we exude. And he went on to say, we are not just to be a subtle influence like salt, but we are to be an open and blatant influence like light, close quote. And that made me think of these two parallel verses. This one uh, also out of Matthew's Gospel. It's around Matthew 16. It's, uh, it's this. Jesus then told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, there's a, I've studied this previously, so let me tell you, there's a fascinating thing in this verse. Fascinating thing in this verse. Particularly for our context. Now, in the original context, Jesus is, quite literally, talking about the cost of following him, that it may very well lead to a crucifixion-like death. Physically as well as spiritually. Spiritually, in order to follow Christ, as we now know, you must die to self. So there is a death involved, and I'm not denying that. But there's a fascinating, when you, uh, when you go into the Greek manuscripts, I discovered this, that the verb used to take up can also in the Greek mean to lift up or to raise up. 
you want to follow after Christ, you need to lift up your cross. You need to raise up your cross. And discovering that, the image that immediately leapt into my mind was that sculpture of the Marines at Iwo Jima. You know, the four of them struggling to raise the American flag. That is what we are supposed to be doing to the cross. Putting it on display, wearing it openly, letting everyone know this is the thing by which I am identified. It's stunning to me that in the age in which we live, where everybody's got their own personal identifier, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I'm these two things put together, even my gender is, can't be nailed down. I'll just, I, I'm a dragon, I'm a whatever. There is actually, there's a man in Arizona who self-identifies as a dragon. He's had a lot of tattoos and cosmetics. I mean, you can be anything you want to be. Oh, but lift the cross. I dare you to lift the cross openly and say, I identify as a Christian. Well, Jesus wasn't kidding. There will be a price to pay for that. Why? Because you are suddenly bearing light, shedding light onto everybody else so that they can look at the things by which they identify themselves and see how horrible and hollow and fruitless they ultimately are. Listen, Christians are called to lift high the cross. Do we do that here in Canada? Do we do that? You don't need to answer out loud, it's a rhetorical question. I don't believe that we have. Certainly not over the past several decades. And I, I will count myself as guilty as the next person of not lifting high the cross, of not living the identity that I've been given these past several years since I came to a true faith. Look, one of the hallmarks of being a Christian, all right? One of the hallmarks of, sorry, of being a Canadian, I should say. One of our hallmarks is that we strive to be unoffensive. Right? We're known around the world as a polite, kind of want to get to know you problem. I can't think of anybody in the world who's got a problem. Oh, he's a Canadian. Oh, I mean, listen, there is a reason that Americans sew Canadian flags to their backpacks when they travel through Europe. Because they've got a horrible reputation and they're riding our coattails. Right? The Canadian passport has been called the key to the world. That's how widely accepted it is. I don't know if you remember, a number of years ago, there were some Israeli intelligence agents, and they, they got caught using Canadian passports because that just let them into places that they otherwise couldn't go. Canadians are loved, respected. Why are we loved and respected? Because we're just polite, and we don't make waves, and we're just, we just want to get to know you. There's nothing offensive about us. Passively and actively, and we don't cause offense. And too many of us, and as I say, I've been gu as guilty of this as the next person, so many of us refuse to lift high the cross to let our light shine for just that reason. It might offend somebody. And that's why I say that this, of all the Beatitudes, I believe is the great challenge for us in the 21st century contemporary Canadian church, because it is this Beatitude that comes in direct opposition to our cultural drives. We want to be good Canadians, we want to be good citizens, we don't want to offend people, we don't want to hurt feelings, and yet at the same time, we are called to be salt and to be light. We are called to let people know they are dying. We have to let them know, if even by looking at the way in which we live, that they are living in darkness. And so those two are at loggerheads. For decades, I believe that the church has sided with the cultural side. We have hidden the light. And that's why it's currently in its state of anemia and filled, just as Lloyd-Jones worried, with superficial Christians. Listen, for 12 weeks we have said these are not a list of commands. And in fact, if you go to the very next verse, you'll see that Jesus says, don't think that I've come to destroy the law. What he's saying is, don't think that these 10 points I've just given you are a new decalogue. Don't think, please, that there are a new 10 commandments. I haven't come to overthrow the old 10 commandments. In fact, if you give, me, give me your ears for the next two and a half chapters, I'll tell you, I've actually come to, to expand them, right? I've come to fulfill them. I've come to show you how to live them. In some cases, I've come to show you that the bar is actually far higher than you think it is. But he says, these are not a list of commands. So don't mistake them for such. 
But that being said, there is a command in this final beatitude. Take a look at it. See if you can find it. It is this. Let your light so shine. Now the light is not, as we've said, something that we do. It's something that we are. But nonetheless, there is something to do with this light. Let it shine. Now in the Greek manuscripts, the verb used here is lampsato. I guess from which we get the word lamp. Lampsato. And it's in, if you know anything about grammar, they don't teach it in schools anymore, but maybe you remember your grammar lessons. It's in what's called the imperative mood. It means it is a command. Go and do this. So when he says, let your light so shine, I mean, it, it, you, quite literally it translates like, th like this. Let shine <coughs> as an imperative, as a, as a direct command. Let shine. In fact, it's let shine the light of you. Now, just previous to that command, Jesus points out that if you have light, it does no good to hide it under something. He points out that you would never light a candle, you would never cover it, that would just, I mean, that would be ridiculous, but you would, instead, what do you do with a candle? You put it on a stand. You put it on a stand and therefore that one candle gives light to everybody in the house. It benefits a multitude of people. The candle's whole purpose is to give light. Also, you know, maybe to smell good, but mostly, mostly to give light. Giving off light is its whole reason for being. A candle that doesn't give off light is useless. Do we all have a candle somewhere in the junk drawer that's got a wick? You know, it's so low that it won't, won't catch the flame. Ours seems to resurface every couple of years. I don't know why we hang on to it. We should throw it away. Why? Because it doesn't work. It can't produce light. It doesn't produce light. Lighting a candle and hiding it, Jesus tells us, would not only be completely ridiculous, it would render the light completely ineffective. What's it going to illuminate under that bushel, hidden in that cloak, stuffed in that pocket? Light has to shine. It's just a no-brainer. If you have a light and you are made light, you have to let that light shine. Then why do we not? Why do we hide it? Because we do, both as individuals and as the larger corporate church. We do this around the world, but particularly in this country. We hide our light. To be more specific, we hide Christ's light, yes? Because it was never ours to start with. So the offense is actually all the worse. We are hiding Christ's light. Who are we to do that? How dare we do that? When Christians hide, let me, let me maybe give you another word this morning. When they downplay, when they downplay the light, when they downplay their identity, they do far more than just hide light. They hide hope. They hide joy. They hide obedience. They hide their whole new nature. Christians who hide their light hide their identity because the two things cannot be separated. So again, I ask why? why. Why might we be hiding our light? Are we ashamed of it? Are we ashamed of the light? Then we must ask ourselves if we value our ego more than Christ. Are we afraid to be the light? Maybe because it'll bring persecution or alienation. Are we afraid to be the light? If we are, then we must think that the world is more powerful than Christ. Those who are genuinely in Christ think not of themselves. Those who are genuinely in Christ fear nothing in the world, for greater is he that is in me, in us, than anybody, any force out there in the world. So let it shine. Christians hide their light in all kinds of ways, but I think that these are the two biggest offenders. These, these are the ways in which we do it most. I'll present to you this morning. I'm going to go, this is a little longer, but I, I just, I've got to get through this for you. There are two ways in which we hide our light, and they, are, they I believe, are this. One is apathy. The other is capitulation. What do you mean by that, Braden? Apathy. Apathy is simply we don't care. Okay? We don't care. That we lose our drive. 
that we look maybe at the world and the darkness and everything that's going on in it, that we look at the cultural trends, we look at the way things are going, and we just we throw our hands in the air. We just we, get, we throw in the towel. We stop fighting against the current. We convince ourselves it's too big, it's too deeply ingrained, there's nothing to be done, we can't affect change, the problem's too big. This, this anti-God position or behavior or whatever it is that we're confronted by, it, it's got too much support behind it, maybe. We can't stop it. It's a runaway train. I can't possibly apply enough brake. So we just, I think, sometimes stand back and let it crash. That's not being the light. The apathetic Christian hides their light by keeping it to themselves. The apathetic church hides its light by putting it under a bushel. And this morning I would challenge you with this, that very often that bushel has four walls and a steeple. Quite content to keep the light amongst itself. But letting it shine out there, ah, what's the point? So sometimes I think apathy sets in, which is a shame. The other way in which I think it sets in that works against us is this, capitulation. The, particularly the Canadian church capitulates. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean by, I will dim down the light. Maybe, you know, we won't maybe hide it completely. We'll just, we'll put a shade over it so that it's not so bright. We dim it down so that it doesn't hurt the eyes so much of those who dwell in darkness. If you ever come in from a dark room into a totally bright room, ah, right? hit you like that, you're blinded. But if you come in and you, you go in maybe into a twilight room, you let your eyes adjust, not so bad. You can kind of ease into it. That's what I mean by capitulation. We dim the light so that it's not quite so hurtful or startling. We, we let a little darkness in. Because that's really the only thing that can dim or dull or dilute light. We, just, we let a little darkness in. And before long, there are Christians, in big air quotes, who seem content to say nothing on issues of fidelity, on the structure of marriage, the sanctity of life. Capitulation means that we behave one way when we're with fellow Christians. Right? We all put on our plastic Sunday smiles. Everything is great. We behave churchy when we're with our fellow Christians. And as soon as we're out the door, it's a totally different story. When we're with non-believers, superficial Christians take pains not to flaunt the things that set them apart or at odds. What does that mean practically? Listen, maybe this, this, the Christian who's capitulated goes out for an evening with the brothers and sisters, okay, and is the model of temperance. But when that same superficial Christian goes out for a few points with the boys, taken to drunkenness. That's what we mean. Capitulate. I don't want them to feel bad about their own imbibing, so I just go along. Capitulation means that Christians and churches begin welcoming all faiths as being equal. That they start to reject biblical doctrines in favor of whatever's popular in the culture at the moment. Capitulation means that they start to imitate the world and its thinking and its living now, oftentimes, I will give credit, oftentimes with a kind of good intention, thinking that perhaps if we dim the Christ-like and the, the, the Christ light enough, if we, if we dim it down enough, that that'll act as, a, as an incentive to get people in the door, to get them kind of started on the pathway of faith. And, and then maybe once they're in, we can, we can turn it back up again. But intentions, something paving, something road to hell as the saying goes. No, the light cannot be dimmed. It never works that way. The church has tried this for decades in terms of its seeker sensitive movements and in terms of its doctrinal light movements and in terms of innumerable, innumerable I should say, innumerable sermons that were inoffensive to the people in the seats but completely offensive to God. Why? Because they were sermons that never cracked open the Bible that never brought the word. Your word is a lamp, a light unto my feet, which means that the word itself 
is blinding and potentially offensive to some people. Christians who come into the church for the half-light, right? Christians who come for the half-light remain in the half-light. And they will flee for the hills the moment that you start to turn up the wattage. And concerned about bums and seats, concerned about numbers, concerned about declining growth, churches that have brought people in by projecting half-light never turn up the wattage because they don't want the people to leave. And so the whole church, despite its perhaps good intentions, just remains in a state of dim twilight, which does not reflect or demonstrate the blinding, full power light of Christ. Superficial Christians have a dimmer switch. Get me? Superficial Christians turn it up and down. Sometimes they turn it off. They have a dimmer switch. Genuine Christians do not. Genuine Christians are turned on, full blast, and they are done so at the very moment they become kingdom citizens. They're turned up full. Now, as, as, as we grow in maturity, as we grow in a depth of knowledge of the Holy Spirit, as we become ever more Christ-like on this continuing cycle of Beatitudes, of questioning, of self-examination, of growth, of submission. As we go through this, we become ever more Christ-like, and therefore our light becomes brighter and brighter. But it doesn't matter how many years you might have been a Christian. Maybe it's only been a couple of months. Maybe it's been decades. The point is this. The genuine Christian will never hide it. No matter how much of it they've got, whether it's just the beginnings at a couple of watts, or whether it's the million candle watt power that flows out of someone who's been in the spirit for decades, no matter what they've got, they let it shine. Boldly and unapologetically, that's how they let people know that Christ is in them. That's how they let people know that they used to be in bondage to darkness, but now they live in the kingdom of light. That is how they let people know that they were once dead, but now they're alive. That's how they let people know that we used to be imprisoned in the chains of sin, but now Christ has set us free. Let me tell you this. The shining light of the genuine Christian is a testimony of conversion. A testimony of conversion. It is declarative, evangelistic proof that if it happened to me, it can happen for you. That when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, that it paid not only for my sins, but it took them away. And more than that, it made possible so that everyone who believes in him can have the same thing happen to them. They can become entirely new people. They can have new hearts. They can be filled with righteousness. They can be defined by meekness. They are no longer fearful of death or condemnation. But instead, they live in the hope that just as God saw fit to raise Jesus up from the grave, so too will he someday do that for us. The shining light of the genuine Christian is intrinsically evangelistic. Listen, we all want to see the gospel spread. And even the larger church in the country says that this is its raison d'etre, its whole point of, of existing. But it goes about it completely backwards. It tries to get people into the church through active evangelism. Now, there is a place for that. But that's not what we're looking at here this morning. We're looking at an evangelism that naturally comes out of you. You don't have to worry or maybe sit and fret. Oh, I don't know how to share the good news. I, I don't know how to, how to let other people know about the goodness of Christ. If you are living a genuine and dynamic and very different from the rest of the world Christian life, it will be noticed. The shining light of the Christian drives us to do good. It empowers the good we do to such a degree that those who witness it can draw only one conclusion. That God is in this place. God is involved in this mighty work, whatever it is. There can be no other, they, they can't come to any other conclusion. They can't come to any other conclusion. And a church filled with Christians like this, 
Imagine a whole church full of Christians radiating light. Just light upon light upon light. A church that is filled with such Christians is, our Lord says, a city on a hill. It cannot be ignored. But it's just naturally drawing attention. And it's naturally drawing people to it. It hasn't launched a new daycare program. It hasn't launched a neighborhood barbecue. It hasn't launched a men's Bible study. It hasn't done anything. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but I'm trying to get it through to you that the church, when it behaves as the church, and Christians, when they naturally radiate the full and wonderful and beautiful light of Christ, when they lift him up, that men are naturally drawn to him and to his church. And if we want to start a paradigm in the 21st century of how to reinvigorate the Canadian church, and if we want to seriously sit down and examine how do we approach church growth, it begins here. It does not begin with dimming down the light. It does not begin with how should we dress? What should the music be like? How can we get those people in here and make them feel at home? That's all completely backwards. It begins with building up the people in Christ, so that they radiate him, so that the, the church becomes that city on a hill, so that the people living in the neighborhoods and working in the downtowns and laboring in the fields who are in darkness see it and go, what is this? We have to go see it. We have to see what this is about. What's going on here? What is it that makes these people so different from us? Who are these Christians? And more importantly, who is this Christ? Who is this Christ that lets them live like this? What is the reason for their hope? No one will ask that if we are not living in it. Yes? What is the reason for their hope? And then all of that leads to this. How can I be like them as well? How can I get some of that? Please, tell me. I see it in you. It shows me how empty and fruitless everything I've done in my life is. I want what you have. How did you get it? Oh, well, let me tell you about the one who gave it to me. There we go. Evangelism, square one, begins with a church that acts like a church. And with Christians who refuse to dim down or hide their light. Finally this, the shining light of the genuine Christian serves as a warning to others. As a warning to others. It not only demonstrates to an increasingly atheistic culture that God exists, but that he is holy. Because his holiness ends up getting mirrored in all that we do. You understand? They look at us. They see the way in which we live. What is the reason for the, re the way in which they live? What is the reason for their hope? What is the reason that they don't fear bullets or terrorists or death? What is the reason for that? Well, it's God. And if they're made like God, not only is there a God, but when they look at us, they start to see some of what he is like. And that is holy. Returning them once again to the very first sermon I got to guest preach here. Live lives that are holy. Because the one who called you, the one who indwells you, the one who radiates out through you is holy. That holiness is mirrored in everything that we do. God is holy, declares the genuine Christian life. The genuine Christian life says God is holy. But it also says this. It says that God's wrath is set against things that are unholy. And that's why I don't do them. It says that God's wrath is set against things that are dark and selfish. That's why I shun them. God's, God's wrath is set against all things dark. And that's why I mortify the sin in me. Daily I work and strive at it. And when I fail, I go back to him and ask him to help me deal with it. And I repent of it. Listen, if you're reveling in those things, this is what the genuine Christian life says to those. If you're reveling in these types of things, then his wrath is set against you as well. And each day you spend in darkness is another day spent storing up wrath upon wrath. And a day is coming when that wrath in its fullness, will be poured out. And those who live their whole lives in darkness are going to be crushed under the weight of it. They are going to pay for their transgressions in an eternal debtor's prison that we call hell. 
And it will not be because God is mean or hates them. It will be because they did it to themselves by choosing to remain in darkness. The world is a pitch black night. And the people that are in it are ships. And they are on a high speed collision course against a rocky shore. They are speeding towards their deaths. Right? Their little lives that they've crafted all about them. Those are about to be dashed apart. If not now, then definitely someday. They will be blown apart and they will fall into a churning sea and they will get dragged down into the freezing depths and they will be lost forever in an eternal blackness with no hope of rescue. But even as they careen towards destruction, they boast about the rightness of their course. They mock and they take offense at our warnings to turn away before it's too late. Listen to me. Adjust your course. No, they demand instead that we get out of their way. That we accommodate them. The superficial Christian, the superficial church, the very thing that Martin Lloyd-Jones was so dead set against six decades ago, it gets out of the way. The superficial Christian moves aside and hides the light. But the genuine holds their ground and says, I'm a lighthouse. Your call.